How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. We've got Brian Alvarez here. We'll be taking your phone calls and your emails, talking about all of the current news, Raw, Nitro, ratings, Mike Tyson. <laughs> I can't believe that anyone is taking that story seriously. Brian, are you there? I'm here. Um, you know, Antonio Noki yesterday at the airport on his way back to Los Angeles at the Narita Airport had a press conference. And, you know, was just talking about, like, they've got the Tokyo Dome, they're going to run Mike Tyson against Naoya Ogawa. Uh, said they're going to pay Mike Tyson between four and five billion yen, which is roughly four, forty million dollars. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm just thinking, like, okay, great. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, how do you make back, okay, Mike Tyson against Lennox Lewis is not, Mike Tyson can't make forty million dollars, he can't make close to forty million for that fight. How is he going to make that amount of money for a match, work, shoot, or indifferent with Naoya Ogawa? I mean, think of the box office potential. And, and the United States is still the main country when it comes to drawing revenue on pay-per-view, which is the main revenue source for a big fight. And think of how many buys Mike Tyson and Naoya Ogawa, most likely on tape delay, and most likely it's going to be either one of two things. It's either going to be a work match, or if it's a shoot match, one way or the other, it didn't go in two minutes, most likely. Maybe Anoki hopes that the yen will be devalued by June. <laughs> no, uh, upvalued. Okay. Something. Or he meant pesos. <laughs> He's going to pay 40 million pesos. <laughs> yeah, something like that. But anyway, um, that's, that's... Now, somebody emailed doing. me something today that I didn't get a chance to check out yet, but um, something like an ESPN article... On my yeah, yeah, it, is that what you're talking yeah, about? It, 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 no, that was uh, that was just Shelley Finkel just saying that you know there's like nothing to this story. Okay. It's totally made up. Okay. So that's what the is. I was afraid ESPN that, that was, might have uh, reported it as a fact. No, that it's actually a, an AP article um, that's gone around, which is just Shelley Finkel denying everything. Um, you know, saying that he's never even spoken to these people, and that uh, the lawyer who sent the facts, uh, Michael Smith, I believe. Uh, sent the facts to Anoki that he read on that pay-per-view last week, has been put on notice, or something like that. So, hmm. anyway, that's the deal there. Uh, let's see. I was very surprised last night, uh, watching Raw, at the lack of mention of that two out of three fall match, the lack of appearance of Triple H, who I figured would do about a 40-minute interview. <laughs> I don't know what it is. That's tonight. Yeah, I guess you're probably right. I was just told that, um, I actually got the word. There are artistic reasons for Triple H not being on the show. So, I'll probably get a what artistic reasons is, I'll probably have a better idea later tonight, but that was, that's what I was told. Yeah, it was really weird. I mean, you know, Rock came out, Austin came out, they had their stare down, it's like they started building a WrestleMania, and made just absolutely no mention of it. It's like nothing like Hunter beat Austin last night or anything, it was just... But you know what was weird to me is, okay, they got the, they've got the replay show tonight. And now that, if there's ever a pay-per-view that you want to hype the replay show of, uh, that's the one. Yeah. Because it's one of the best pay-per-views they ever did. And the buy rate probably wasn't, you know, I mean, I, 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 I'm presuming the buy rate probably wasn't through the roof because people saw it as the, the in-between show between WrestleMania, I mean, between Royal Rumble and WrestleMania. And this is the one, you know, we're all going to buy WrestleMania. This is the one we can skip. And because of that, you would really, you know, you, I think that the, if they really emphasize that this was like the greatest match in a long time, plus the other match with Rock was a great match, and the Intercontinental match was a great match, and it's just a hell of a show, and they didn't really pump it nearly as much as I expected. Yeah, I don't know why that is. I don't know. Maybe they were so embarrassed about the finish of the main event that they didn't want anybody to see it. Well, you know what's funny about that, too? Is Did you notice that Rock in his interview... He noted that Kurt Angle kicked out of the people's elbow, but never mentioned that he kicked out of the rock bottom. Yeah. You know, I guess the way was it, Hebner just screwed up, right? Yeah, that's what it looks like. Yeah. Uh, just, I don't know. I totally can't see Kurt Angle screwing up, though, you know? Why not? It's, it's not the perfect. finish. But there's one thing you're not going to screw up, it's kicking out of the finish. Most likely. I mean, if the plan right. really was two. But how many? But it's not like Earl Hebner's got a bad track record screwing up because if he was ever going to screw up because of nerves, we know when that would have been. Yeah. <laughs> so he didn't do it. He didn't even let on that uh, he was going to 
I mean, he, he, he refed that whole match in Montreal like nothing was wrong. And then he did what he needed to do and Take ran the fastest. Out of Dodge. That, <laughs> he ran as fast as he ever has. <clears throat> right after that. Uh, let's see. Uh, ratings. I've got all kinds of ratings. And the XFL, in fact, did break the all-time record for the lowest-rated show in prime time in the history of one of the four major networks with that two-point. It ended up with a 2.6. So that's a new mark that they can try to beat. Actually, overall, they were not down too much. The um, UPN game uh, did a 1.4. That was down from a 1.5 last week. And the TNN game did an 09 national, and I believe it was a 1.1. So it's basically... You know, with a tenth of a point. Uh, so it's just, again, very slight decreases um, for UPN and TNN. A little bit bigger decrease for NBC. But, um, you know, NBC still, when I look at the quarters, uh, they they had a pretty steady decline still. The other ones did not. Let's see. Uh -huh. uh, NBC opened at a 3-1 and got down as low as a 2-1 and then actually rebounded up to a 2-4 by the finish. For the uh, TNN game, they started at an 0-7. And finished it in 01, which isn't really, that, that wasn't the kind of growth they had last week. And UPN, I think. And 01? 07. Okay. 07 and end up in a 10. Okay, 10. Yeah, for the finish. And the UPN was a 1 3 up to a 1, actually a 1 9 for the finish of the game. Hmm. So, um, for the last seven minutes, which went after prime time. Uh, let me see. Let me look at these other numbers here uh, for wrestling. Uh, Livewire won two, Superstars won two, Heat won eight, no big story there. Raw did a 5-1, up slightly, um, and Nitro did a 2-1. I haven't figured out uh, exactly what that is, if it broke last week's all-time low record. I guess it probably was a little bit higher than last week. This was last week 2.05. Uh, this one may see 1,681,000 1, homes. Uh, I don't have my calculator here, so it's 2.1. Uh, the main event, Jeff Jarrett and Dustin Rhodes, did set an all-time record for the lowest-rated main event in the history of the program with a 1-6. They broke a record that Flair and DDP set several years ago uh, for a really pathetic match in Charlotte with Rick trying to play heel in Chicago against DDP. You can imagine how bad that was. It's a sucky match. Anyway, last night's match with Dustin and Jeff Jarrett, that match sucked, too. <laughs> it was kind of funny because I was watching it, and about halfway through I was going, this is bad. It's not that bad. And then, like, by the time the thing was over, I was like, "That was utterly horrible." Yeah, they had a good, they had a good sick man though. Oh yeah, that was with awesome. The of, with the return of Booker T. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that was awesome. It was good though. I really liked it. I mean, it was. Um, I just like the whole the way the whole thing was set up. You know, Booker came back, just got a huge pop. They went right into the match. You know, he pinned Steiner clean in a tag. I like that. And uh, I just thought the whole thing was done really well. I mean, as far as like the whole thing about Booker T coming back already. I think that uh, doesn't necessarily bode well for the future, but uh, as far as no. what actually happened, I thought it was really good. Yeah, they did a good job with it. I, the idea that they would bring him back and kind of like, you know, for one week's rating, which he didn't deliver anyway, Yeah. and, and, and it wasn't going to. You know, a return of Booker T ain't going to make, you know, it would make a tenth of a point difference in the whole rating when all is said and done, probably. Yeah. Uh, is it worth, like, getting rid of your long-term plans for that tenth of a point? I mean, that, and that's all it was going to do. Yeah. And you're bringing Sting if they do that. I mean, I don't know what the plan is for that, but if they were to do that, you know, that's not going to make a big difference either. You hear anything about Arn Anderson other than, I mean, I know he had a two-week suspension. What the details of that? What, why I didn't hear suspended? any details. I mean, I read your thing about it having something to do with booking a match with Luger. and um, I think it was the Luger-Palumbo match, but I'm not sure. Well, I was watching a Luger-Palumbo match, and, um, you know, he put Palumbo over, but it was like a total... Hulk Hogan job. He just pummeled this kid the entire match, did the small package job, got up and just pummeled him again, and I thought, yeah, that's really putting that kid over. So maybe they got pissed about that. They should have. Yeah. This is, that's that's garbage. I mean, yeah. it's like Lex Luger when it comes to putting over Palumbo. You know, he needs, they need to put guys over, not that BS, fake, oh, yeah, you know, yes. like he, Hulk Hogan, he and Vampiro, and Billy Kidman stuff. Yeah, like, that was really horrible. Helped, really helped their careers. Yep. See Thursday night in now Calpon, Mexico, at the IWRG TV tapings, the biggest match of the year in Mexico. Uh, he held Del Santo putting his mask on the line against Doctor Cerebro. So I'll uh, we'll have that result probably on Friday. Uh, let me see what else we've got here. Uh, let's see more Tyson stuff. Um, yeah, I mean just the economics of it. I mean it's it's like, I mean how is that thing? They don't have strong pay per view in Japan. They don't close circuit for all intents and purposes, doesn't exist. I mean, you can 
I mean, if, 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 if Mike Tyson fought Naoya Gao at the Tokyo Dome, it would sell out the Tokyo Dome. And they probably could jack ticket prices up to the point where they could probably do seven, eight, nine million. Okay, but where, where do you make the rest of your money? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just economically, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, we forgot to do this yesterday. We also have today's. This is some of the poll stuff. Very scary numbers. Did you, did you, did you check on the, the the poll numbers for Super Bowl are so scary. Thumbs up, twelve percent. Thumbs down, seven percent. Thumbs in the middle, nine percent. Didn't see the show, 69%. Is that the highest that, ever? Uh, I think it, it's either the highest or ties the highest. Uh, the um, Which pay-per-view would this be? The, um, is it the January pay-per-view? No, 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 no. The, the Star, I think the Starcade was, was pretty close to that. Like maybe yeah, Starcade was really high. Yeah, but that, you know, that's why there's an economic disaster in January. <laughs> Remember? That's right. Yeah, okay, for... Uh, for no way out, 61% thumbs up, 3% down, 7% in the middle, 29% didn't see the show, which is also a little bit above average for didn't see the show, but as far as the reaction to it, pretty damn good. Uh, tonight, tonight's poll question is, uh, what did you think of last night's wrestling? A, Raw was better. B, Nitro was better. C, didn't watch Raw. Uh, D, didn't watch Nitro. E, didn't watch Raw or Nitro. And we'll talk about Raw and Nitro. Um, what are your thoughts on Raw? We'll start with that. We'll start with Raw. The one thing about Raw that I mean, I, I didn't really like uh, either show last night. Um, I, really, I, liked, I like I like both. You did? Uh, I uh, I mean, I like the whole the whole Booker T thing on Nitro, but I mean, overall the show, I guess it, I guess it was all right. They had the um, they had the cruiserweight tag team tournament match, and they actually announced the brackets and everything. But, oh, um, I thought the announcement of the brackets kills the tournament. Just because we know who's in it now. Yeah, I mean it's like it's like it's, I know, you know but I want to at least praise the fact that they announced brackets because they usually okay, do. okay, yeah, yeah. The, so it actually looks like a real tournament to me. This is one of those things that they should have saved for when they have a cruiserweight Booker and when they have their act together. Because to me, this tournament you needed. I think to, to get this tournament over, you needed a Mexican team, you needed a Japanese team. I mean, you needed you needed a lot of people that no one's ever seen before. And I'm sorry, but Johnny Swinger and Jason Lee, uh, Jamie Noble play. and Scotty O. There you go. The fact that Scotty O is in it, that you know Johnny Swinger is in it, that Jason Lee, who nobody even knows outside of Ohio Valley Wrestling, is in it. Not that he did a bad job last night. I mean, you just need. I mean, it, it looks to people watching this that this is some jobber tournament, and the, yeah. the, the cruiserweight division already has that jobber image already, and that's why you need new faces and new faces that are really good and like give it an international flavor. Hey, this this team's coming in from Japan. This team's coming in from Mexico. Um, Hype the fact that they're coming in. I mean, and then and here's the other thing: the one guy that they are actually doing promo packages for, he's coming. He's coming. Kid Romeo is not in the tournament unless he's the old Skipper's mystery part. I think he's going to be. Oh well, okay. Well then, at least that makes a little sense. But um, and then the other thing I thought was interesting during that match was uh, they did the Kidman and Ray match, and uh, here's Kidman doing a springboard shooting star press, and I know he's done it for years off the top rope and everything like that, but. Uh, I mean, poor AJ Styles, he had one thing really going for him, this fantastic move, and uh, Kidman used it. There you go. Yep. So, I don't know. I mean, overall, I didn't. I wasn't too impressed with the show other than the uh, the sixth man, and I really thought the main event was just horrible. I hate that heel ref thing, and uh, the match didn't even help with uh, the work in the ring, but uh, overall, I wasn't impressed with that show. And Raw... Um, I like the stuff with Rock and Austin just because the fans were so into it. And you could tell that they're just going to go crazy for that match. Um, Dean Malenko and Taco was all right, but it was really short. Um, and, of course, they had the main event. And it was Kurt Angle, The Rock, and The Big Show. One man who does not fit. And you know, you, I, I will say so this. The match was a lot better than I expected. But at the same time, it was so much worse than it would have been with just Rock and Angle in there. Plus, everybody was running in. You got, you got uh, Albert on at 11 o'clock at night, beating up The Rock. Well, that was the totally rock. wrong with that. I think that the whole deal is they just, they're just trying to get over this, these guys in the hardcore division, and Albert just, all the guys who don't have a role, they're in the hardcore division. But why ruin a, what could have been a good main event by putting Big Show in there and doing all these run-ins? Because they had no way out. What do you mean they had no way out? They had no way out of the match. They weren't going to beat any of those three guys, so they wanted to beat... I'm just three. wondering why they even made the match in the first place. So they wanted to beat S.A. Rios. Well, they did that thing. I'll tell you what. Now, 
The one thing that, that I, I will say, when that match started, okay, remember we were talking about the Big Show doing his run in, it, in the main event and hurting that main event? Yeah. Like, well, maybe it'll make sense on night on uh, Raw tonight. Now that I saw Raw, I'm even madder that they did that run in because they could have done a million things on Raw to set that match up and not ruin, I don't want to say ruin, that's way too strong a word, not hurt. I mean, if you take that Big Show thing out of that match and the finish out of that match, you know, where the referee screwed up or whatever, I mean, you had a match that was probably just as good as the Helmsley match, or very, very close. And, you know, the, the, the big, you know, it's like, why, you know, I don't know, why have Big Show run in in something good? I'm just so frustrated with Big Show being involved in the main events at all. Well, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't mind that they put him in a three-way, but, you know, the whole thing is... I didn't, because it took the three-way down, or it took yeah. the match down. Well, you know, they already done the run. I mean, once they done the run, in, you knew that where they're going. They had to get him involved. Yeah, now, I mean, decision, the whole thing is the decision the to get him right involved. Now. Go ahead. The decision to get him involved. I mean, I totally disagree with because he hasn't earned it. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, the WWF right now, their their upper card, you know, their main eventers are are really really good, and to throw this guy in there that's going to take down every single match because he's nowhere near their level, just because he's big. It just drives me crazy. I mean, I was watching him last night, and I watched him the last couple times. That's been the Vince McMahon mentality from, from ever since he was a child. Yeah. And, I mean, the whole thing is, I, I will say that he's working harder, and he's trying. But at the same time, they could put me on the XFL field, and I could work really hard and try. That doesn't mean I should be in the game. And you won't help ratings either. No, I wouldn't help ratings. I'd have a shitty game, and there's no reason <laughs> for me to be in there. Now, I got a question. Being that you're not a football fan at all, what did you think of that Jesse Ventura Rusty Tillman angle? Because to me, as someone who is a football fan, I thought it was so unbelievably pathetic. Well, I fast forwarded through it, so that's what <laughs> I, I mean, thought of me, it. Oh, it was just so bad. You know, I guess what was Trish wasn't going to be dumping Vince, was she? No, she wasn't. <laughs> kind of figured that, that one was coming. Uh, actually, I think it was pretty obvious that one was coming. Uh, not exactly what they did, though. It was rather. Rather gross, actually. Yes. But uh, anyway, that's that's what happens. How come they never do that to China? You know, because Trish Stratus. <laughs> remember how China was ripping on on Trish Stratus and everything? And I think that the performance that Trish Stratus did on the pay per view was better than most, but not all, of China's performances in her career with a hell of a lot more training now. And with like, better you know, workers. And, yeah, with much China better workers. China usually has good people to work with. China's never worked with anyone like Stephanie before. Oh, imagine that match. Yeah. Now, last night, in that uh, two minutes or so before they did their little angle and Stephanie and uh, Trish worked, lightning did not strike twice. <laughs> that was really, I mean, I guess it wasn't hideously bad, but it was as bad as I expected the match night before to be. I don't know if there's something wrong with me, but uh, when Vince was chewing out Steve Regal, chewed him out two nights in a row, in the very, very back of my mind, the Markish portion of my mind, I thought, I hope he stretches Vince tonight. But he oh, did. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I, I don't know. Steve Regal to me is like so great. He is. You know. Um, hopefully, hopefully when he gets back in the ring this time, uh, he'll be able to get better crowd reactions. Yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, he's. I mean, he gets great crowd reactions for everything, but his wrestling, and his wrestling is. Awesome. His wrestling. It's really good, but you know what? It's not the best thing he does. His acting is actually better than his wrestling, mm -hmm. which is so funny because it's another one of those people that like. WCW had and thought that the whole problem with him was that his acting wasn't good enough. Everyone knew his wrestling was good, right? You know, kind of like Steve Austin. Oh, you know, everyone knows he's a great worker, but he doesn't have any charisma. Yep. Oh, God. You know, or, oh, well. Uh, let me just see if there's any other notes from that show. Uh, nothing really. I don't know. I mean, what was it? Was, uh, Kaz was trying to be Tammy Faye Baker. I thought that was pretty, pretty weak. Uh, Undertaker and Kane killing everybody again. Yeah, well, yeah, well, that was going to happen, wasn't it? I know, but um, I guess I, I guess Edge was off the show because of a bad back. Mm -hmm. Uh So I think we talked about that. And um, but X Pac and Justin Incredible against Ben One Eddie Guerrero was a pretty good match. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously going somewhere with Ben One Eddie, which is. Certainly, if they wrestle at WrestleMania and have a 15-minute match, it will not be the worst match on that show. I mean, Benoit didn't do, like, a face turn or anything like la like that last night, but, I mean, there were, there were some spots, like when he was going up for the headbutt, where he started to get that big pop, 
Phil is a heel, and I'm sitting there going, this guy's going to turn babyface, and he's not going to be, like, huge, but they'll love him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anything else before we start hitting emails? Uh, I think that's it. If I think of anything, I'll pipe in. It's from Todd Martin, who says, uh, the line I found funniest on Friday was when Don Fry said that Bob was the craftiest shamrock of them all. Something about that was so funny. Uh, Actually, I think Frank is the craftiest of them all. That's my feeling. Uh, someone goes, that was the way for Nitro to keep people from flipping over to Raw at 9. Actually, I think, even though it, it, I can't say it really worked or didn't work, the rating dropped from a 2.6 to a 2.2 when Raw started, which is less than a usual drop. I thought that as far as the execution and the timing and everything like that, I thought it was pretty damn good. Yeah, it was. The one thing, I don't know if it was just me and I was just in a bad mood last night, but that segment was so long, it was like almost a half hour. And so from that point forward till the end of the show, it seemed to me like there was a commercial just they doubled up constantly, on commercial, right. commercial, commercial, commercial. Yeah, for, for spring break. Yeah, spring, and I was thinking, you know, if I were just watching this for fun, I'd been pissed and turned it off by now. Well, some people did. They, they did some of the lowest quarter ratings in the history of the company last night. For, um, what was it, uh, for Canyon and uh, Sean O'Hare. Canyon did a good job with Sean O'Hare, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, I thought Canyon was really good last night. And I understand, in fact, we should actually talk about, we should actually talk about Thunder real quick. We forgot, we haven't done that yet. Uh, last night's Thunder in New Orleans. Basically, the first match is good, which actually on Thunder usually is the case. <laughs> and the last match was good, which on Thunder usually isn't the case. And I heard in the middle was... You kind of skipped the middle. The uh, tag team tournament, the Young Dragons beat Mike Sanders and Kiwi. I heard Mike Sanders kind of didn't belong, but the Young Dragons were really good. And it was a good match. Good match. Sean Stacey against Johnny the Bull, I was told, was worse than you would think. And considering what I usually think of Sean Stacey, <laughs> that's, that's not good. Uh, Shane Helms beat Johnny Swinger. I heard they kind of had a style clash, but it was okay. Mike Awesome beat Conan. I was told that that was okay. Chuck Palomo beat Disco, which I heard was told was horrible. Uh, lots of run-ins. Uh, Rick Steiner beat Vito, which I heard was horrible. Uh, then Canyon did an interview with a broom, which he said that the broom looked exactly like Ms. Jones, except the broom had better hair. <laughs> and then he started giving the broom a pounding until uh, the cat did a run-in to save the broom. Yeah, they don't save the wrestlers. But they save the brooms. And then Booker did they say whether Canyon had a good match with the broom? Oh, you know what? Well, isn't that the saying, that you can have a good match yeah. with a broom? Yep. Well, we'll find out. But that was what they used to say about Ric Flair. You can have a good match with a broom, right? Yep. Yeah, I used to hear that, and I never believed it. Now, I think he once had a good match with a sports coat, but... <laughs> <laughs> Booker T and Scott Steiner wrestled, which I heard was a good match. Both guys working really hard. Booker T had Scott beat, and Rick interferes with the DQ. Uh, DDP came out and gave both Steiners the diamond cutter. And a lot of other run-ins, you know... All the usual suspects did run-ins after that was over. And I would be a still good finish, so that's that's the deal. And they I think it's so funny about DDP is he keeps running running from Scott Steiner on every show, but his gimmick is, I'm not running from you. No, but he ran in on, the, he ran in on him this time, and he gave him a diamond cutter last time in the six-man. That's true. Yeah. He, he's playing mind games with him. But tell, I don't know. That was kind of kind of strange. Yeah, it's, at, least, at least they're trying. Yeah. I, don't, I mean, DDP, the problem with DDP is is he works really hard, and he's a pretty decent interview, but he's just not the number one baby face in a company. And mm-hmm. and he is right now, unfortunately, because everyone, everyone else is gone for God knows how long. I don't know what's going on, and I, and, and I should know. And I really don't, because it changes like every well, two hours. Well, if Sting is back next Monday, the plans are all out the window. Uh, I can't. I mean, I've heard that rumor, but I can't. Be, I can't believe it. But then again, I should be able to believe anything by now. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. With all the crap that people gave Russo, do you really think that Booker T, Scott Steiner, and Jeff Jarrett would have been pushed as hard with Kevin Sullivan booking? Actually, Sullivan was. Uh, Scott Steiner wasn't because he was on suspension at the time for most of that, and Booker T wasn't. With guys like that, at the core of WCW Russo's work may help out in the long run. No, <laughs> believe me. As far as the, the long damage run, that he did is far worse than any of the uh, upsides of his. I regime. don't even know hardly any upside other than yeah, he did. He did get. He Booker gave the young T. guys some of them a chance. Okay, now now not in the right, best way did. possible. Okay, okay, you, you, you're right. He did. He he really wanted to. But today, how many of those guys actually are elevated because of anything Vince Russo did? Yeah, it's because he had no clue how to do it. 
Yeah, I mean, no, Booker T. He's the only one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Booker T. Kind of got up to into a different level, uh, but no, but nobody else. I mean, is is Billy Kidman more over now? He's less over now. Even yeah. though he got a program with Hulk Hogan, he ended up being less over. I think the thing with Booker T. Though was he was a guy that I think was just waiting to get over and be huge. As opposed to some of the guys like the thrillers being thrown on TV that there's just no way, no matter what they do with these guys right now, that they're going to be over huge. Well, they're not ready, and everyone yeah. knows it. Especially because of the interviews. Mm-hmm. Boy, that's such a weakness whenever they talk. It's Sean O'Hare. Uh, let's see. It's from Eddie Atlanta. Uh, what was up with Tommy Rich getting the NWA title for four days? Did he ever defend it, or was it his first title defense the match where he lost back to race? I think... That he won on a Monday, lost on a Friday, and I think he retained it on a Wednesday. But this is 20 years ago, and I don't remember perfectly. I never understood why he was given the belt, even for a few days. Um, if you were watching Georgia Wrestling in 1981, it was totally understandable. I mean, he was the big star of the promotion. They had done an angle a long time before where he left the territory after losing the Harley race uh, because he basically pr- promised to win the world title. He went back to Memphis for a long time, and he came back, and he basically... I don't want to say he had to win it, but if he didn't win it, he you know, it, was, it was one of those. It had been built up for like a long, long time. I was surprised that it happened because Tommy Rich was only a, a star on Georgia Championship Wrestling, and usually the NWA uh, would give their world titles to guys like Dusty Rhodes or Flair. Flair, I guess he, Flair ever won it by '81? No, Flair won it first in '83, I think, right? No, 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 '81, right? Flair won in '81 and lost it in '83. Yeah, okay. Someone's gonna. Hey, he won it in '81 from. Harley Race, right, in uh, Kansas City. Okay. Where did he win? Oh, where did he win from? God, I'm, I'm trying to remember this now. Or was it Dusty Rhodes? Uh, do you remember this? I don't have my book in front of me. I don't anyway. have mine either. Okay. I lent well, it out all... a week after I got it, and I haven't seen it since. What, the title history is? Yeah. That is the, that is the greatest book. Um, I should know all this. Let's see, wait. Rick Flair won it in September because I was coming back from a football game and I turned on my tape at Georgia Championship Wrestling and they opened up by saying Rick Flair just won the title in Kansas City and I was so happy. And then I had the worst date of my entire life that night. No, it was decent. <laughs> Actually, I did. Uh, also, do you, <laughs> but I didn't care. Also, do you know what Austin Idol's up to these days? I know he's living in Gulf Breeze, Florida. He goes, I always thought he would, was a great talker and would have made a good NWA champion. He was a great talker, but he would not have made a good NWA champion because the NWA champion had to have good matches, and Austin Idol was not particularly adept at that. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think it would be a good idea. Oh, my God. This is an interesting one. I know you're going to think this sounds stupid, so that means I'm going to listen to it all the way out. I think it would be a good idea for the WF not to re-sign Triple H when his contract is up. Anyone can see that his influence will destroy the WF and leave them in a similar state to WCW. He's held... Way too much influence, and as long as he's in the company, he's going to hold guys down, whomever he can, and will continue to be the center of the WWF. Guys like Benoit Jericho will never be able to make it to the top with Benoit there to hold him down, and his departure will create more room for new stars to be elevated. Since the WWF has so much talent and is crowded at the top, I'm telling you, losing Triple H would not be the worst thing for their business. It'll never happen, and you know what? If they lost him, hey, if they lost Austin, you know, and it wasn't the worst thing for their business, the bottom line is they could lose Triple H, and it wouldn't be either. Um, mm-hmm. Nevertheless, if I was in charge, I would have a hard time justifying not signing a guy who's done what he's done in the last 18 months. I mean, I mean granted, you know, when we, there's upsides and downsides. But, I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that if he's, if he's being a negative as far as his booking, the guy in charge should just not listen to his ideas. Yeah, I think the way the WWF is structured, it could never get as bad as it got in WCW. Maybe I'm wrong. Because it actually got pretty bad when Michaels and Hunter and everybody were in charge, but yeah, yeah, that was a terrible period. I think Vince... if they if, if they brought in if they brought in Nash, you know, it won't get, it won't get as bad as this WCW it won't. No. But if they brought in Nash, uh, it'll get bad mm-hmm. because he'll have to be because you'll have him who has to be on top and Big Show has to be on top, and they're never going to have good matches. No. And then that takes away you know what what they built. Let's see. Wouldn't you love to see Benoit as a babyface go over Steve Austin as a heel for the WF title at next year's WrestleMania? Huh? I, it's a good story. Yeah. You know, I, what, uh, I don't expect it. Uh, Benoit is the greatest babyface because fans want to cheer him because he's got a great work, work ethic and ability. And it would be a great match. Yeah, Austin Benoit matches they've had on TV have been great, no doubt. Uh, great to see Benoit win the title, the biggest pay per view of the year. 
I can't get into Ben Wise a heel anymore, and I'm happy to see them doing a turn. I hope they'll be able to turn Jericho heel so I know where it's a face. Yeah, I, I mean, everyone expects that to come. Austin started taking chops. Never mentioned that during their uh, last match. A lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Does no destiny in S.A. Rios' trunks refer to his future or his past? Actually, both. Uh, how could you not mention Christian as one of the best workers in the WWF? Oh, he's right up there, no doubt. He should be right up there with Benoit, Angle, Helmsley, and Guerrero. The only reason he isn't noticed is because he works tags and doesn't get the opportunity to work 15 to 25 minutes single matches often. I think he's a better worker than Angle. Mm. Mm. Mm, I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, he's a Christian's a Christian's a really, really good worker. But when I watch, I watch Angle. He's got that that Ric Flair thing in him, and, and I don't see that in Christian. Yeah. You know, I mean, Christian's like a. I mean, he's really good, but but. Angle, just the way, like, when he takes bumps and bounces up and down and his offensive moves are, are, are so good and, you know, he does the suplexes so quick. And um, I, I, I would definitely rate Angle ahead of Christian as a worker. Um, let's see. Uh, he hasn't had a chance to be in the position where he can show how great he is. There, there's some truth to that. Um, he hasn't been in a, a long singles program, and he is really good. Uh, he's yet to work individual matches with Austin, Guerrero, Benoit, Angle, Jericho, Helmsley, and look at how awesome he looks in the ring working with lower caliber workers. Well, the Hardys really aren't lower caliber workers. Um, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, if you put Christian in singles competition and allowed him to work longer matches at the top, he certainly stands as being one of the top three or four guys in the company. He may very well, but I'm so scared of them putting him in singles competition because I think that because of his size. Their mindset and, is that Edge is And their, be mind, a and their star. mindset that, 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 that he won't be a star. That's why I always was against the plans to break up Edge and Christian because I always thought that. With their mindset that they would try to give Edge a real big singles push, and he may not be ready for it, although he probably will at some point, and Christian will just flounder yeah. and be like, you know, in that Dean Malenko, Perry Saturn level, just because, you know, even though, even though he's a good worker. So, okay, first off, do you think Trish is a better wrestler than Lita? Yes. Okay. Lita, um... I mean, Lita, Lita flies. She's got some really good flying stuff, but I just watched, like, her basics and... They're really bad. Yes, they are. I know it sounds strange because of all these high spots, but I think Trish's mat technique beats, um, uh, let's see, might have beat Lita's match with Molly Holly. Oh, wait, 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 whatever. Um, he's just talking about different matches. Second part, after Raw, what do you think will happen to Trish? I certainly hope she doesn't get stunk with another 600-pound anchor known as Tess and Albert. Uh, is she getting Jericho Benoit disease after a great paper fruit performance and then is being underused and forgotten? Maybe she should be named Chris Stratus. Yeah, that was pretty cute. i got to make one more comment about last night. In that uh, the mixed tag, mm -hmm. the girls are just going at it and everything like that, and they did this spot where they both just fell down. Oh, that was so bad. That and they cut to thing. a shot of Vince, and then they cut to a shot of Regal, and they're both standing on the apron like, what in the hell was that? <laughs> that, oh, was that was so bad. awesome. <laughs> yeah. You know what? That's an interesting idea. How about Trish Stratus and Chris Jericho as a heel combination? I was thinking it was going to be Trish and Benoit as a baby-face baby combination. Com as a baby-face combination? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Do you think they will hook up Shawn Michaels and Trish Stratus? That could lead to either Vince against Shawn or Hunter against Shawn. Um, I can see Hunter against Shawn. I do not want to see Vince McMahon against Shawn Michaels. <laughs> I, I mean, and I don't think Shawn Michaels wants it either. <laughs> that's, that's pretty tough. How long was Haku's contract that he recently signed? Uh, I don't know, but most of the contracts are three years with an option from for uh, a fourth. Uh, where is Karen McDougal, the Playboy playmate that the WF signed to a developmental deal? I don't even know. When does Rob Van Dam return from All Japan? Uh, on the fourth. Uh, what are the ages of Simon Diamond and Super Crazy? I don't know how old Simon Diamond is. I think Super Crazy is about 20. This is off the top of my head. I'm thinking about 27. That's, that's close. And when was the first pro wrestling match staged at Madison Square Garden? You know, I don't know that that was in the eight, that like 1880s or 1890s. Yeah, and we have an email about that a while ago. Uh, the first one? No, yeah. I don't remember one. But but it was way back before you know, before there was a, before there was a telephone probably. Back when it was uh, an actual garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. It was the old Madison Square Garden because yeah. there have been like three or four of them. Okay, let's see. I had not seen Dean Malenko wear the light heavyweight title in months. Yeah, when he came out with that belt, that was quite a surprise. Yes. So, wh wow, I thought that thing didn't exist anymore. Do you think that that match last night took place because of what Jim Ross said in the Ross report? No. No. No, I just, uh, I think they just, just 
want to do something. If the ratings drop the most during that match, that only gives Vince a bigger reason to drop the belt for good. I know a lot of Internet fans like the light heavyweights, but let's face it, casual fans don't care. Of course they don't care. They've been taught not to care. How could they? How could you care about Dean Malenko defending a belt against Taka Michinoku? Yeah. How, you know, even though, hey, for their three minutes they did a good match, but how, why would you care? Mm-hmm. A lot of emails to get to. We're going to go to the phone calls. We've got full bank calls as well. We'll start with Harry in Oregon. Harry, what's going on? Hey, guys, how you doing? Hey. Doing really good. Yeah, the broom angle really isn't that shocking on Thunder, considering how a mop got more ring time than Triple H last night. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, not more interview time than he's going to be getting in the next week. So. There you go. Hey, did either of you see or hear anything about Jesse Ventura on the National Press Club conference on C-SPAN last night? No. Yeah, I got caught part of it last night. Uh, they asked him about the Rusty Tillman angle, and he actually downplayed it. He said, I respect him. He's a good coach. So almost mm-hmm. like even he's really not that into it. Hmm. Well, I think someone sent me something about that last night. That's, yeah. a, good, that, that's a good way to, to build an angle up. Yeah. Then they, then they asked about the plummeting XFL ratings, and uh, in classic Jesse form, he said, well, give yourselves a hand, and then proceeded to sarcastically clap at the assembled members of the press. Basically blaming fault. them for killing the XFL. It's their fault. That's a, I, I, I mean, someone's got to be a scapegoat for these ratings. <laughs> Isn't that what WCW fans said about us? Uh, not too many of them, really. But we got a few. But some, yeah. Yeah, that's true, some. Yeah, and I'm, I might be in the minority, but I really didn't care for the No Way Out pay-per-view just because I felt uh, some of the commentary was off, and it took away a little from the show. What, because of Taz, or...? Uh, Taz especially, I mean, I think 13 was the number of times he complained about Kurt Angle being the underdog. And he spent so much time echoing JR that made me wonder if he wasn't the illegitimate son of Bob Cottle. Well, you know, the whole deal, um, you know, I mean, they were told, you know, because Kurt was losing, you uh-huh. know, that, that, you know, you got to pump Kurt, you got to pump Kurt. You know, they really wanted to protect him with that loss. And, you know, they may have just gone overboard. And, and there's only so many ways of saying... You know, God, Kurt Angle won a gold medal. He's one of the greatest athletes. He's only been here for two years. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, how many, you know, they had 17 minutes and they, had to, they, and they kept, you know, they kept saying Yeah, but and also, I mean, just minor stuff, but still you can see, uh, like there was no reference to the fact that JR once broke a pitcher over Taz's head. And That's, that's, that's a valid point. That, yeah, that, yeah, that, that was. Uh, I didn't even you know, think about not that. Acknowledging, not acknowledging that old angle. Uh, and Taz calling him a rubber face bastard. Be a little bit more, there should be a little bit more tension there than they, than they showed. You're right. And, and not only that, but Jr. really didn't seem too upset about the fact that uh, Triple H pedigreed him on SmackDown a few days ago. He made a couple stick comments on it, but I just got the feeling if he doesn't care, watch the fans. That's a that's a great point. And he, you know what? He should have should have worn a neck brace. <laughs> mm-hmm. The only problem is, I guess he couldn't because he'd have to wear that neck brace on that XFL game. <laughs> that would just be, and then they would just be roasted. <laughs> like he isn't already. You know, you know, they never should have done that angle. I think is the answer. Because yeah. if you can't, to me, if you can't sell an angle, then why waste your time doing it? Well, and didn't Triple H break his arm like a year ago after he first won the title? Yes, yes, and he only sold that one for about two weeks. But yeah, at least he they, sold it. He had that little cast on and everything. And they did he the really bad that. sound effect carryover with the the Slim Jim snapping when he broke it or something. Yeah, that was pretty corny. And, and a, a rare, uh, and just uh, not to beat up Jim Ross, speaking of roasting him, but a rare mistake he made was uh, during the hardcore cluster, which the less said about that match, the better. He said that uh, two years ago at this event, the Big Show debuted. It was a February pay-per-view, but technically that pay-per-view was titled St. Valentine's Day Massacre and not No Way Out. Like I said, a minor thing, but pretty uncharacteristic of JR. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that, that's, that's true, but I don't know. I don't say. That is minor. Hell, hell hath no fury like us trivia mutants. Yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the fact, hey, you want to get technical? They must have said five times, uh, I mean not five, but three times he was the only gold medalist in the history of the WF, and that's not true either. That's very true. Yeah. He's yeah. The, he was, yeah. as best I can tell, the second gold medalist. Yeah. And we're not talking about the Iron Sheik either. <laughs> Bad News was, bra- was bronze, right? Brad, Bad News won a bronze in 76, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the only one was uh, Villain Ruska, who was only in the WF for a couple matches, but he was in there, and he did win, I think, two golds in uh, 72. Yep, and speaking of trivia, wrestlers annoying other wrestlers trivia, I'm going to send you guys tonight. Cool. cool. I love those things. So enjoy that. Okay. All right, guys, take care. Okay, we're going to, is this uh, Phil in D.C. or Bill in D.C.? Hey, guys. Phil. Hey there. Hey, you guys hear me? Yeah. I can hear you fine. Okay, cool. Um, I picked up that date for you. Um, Flair won it on uh, Flair 91781. I know, I knew it was from Dusty Roads. 
Over Dusty Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes, had be- Dusty Rhodes had beaten Harley Race at the Omni, right? Uh, yep. It's yeah, Atlanta, it's Georgia, so I'm it, assuming it's the Omni. It was the Omni. I, it's all coming back to me. And Flair won it in Kansas City. Yeah, at the... Uh, and then lost the to Jack Vanillo and Dominica, evidently, which I, I'm looking okay, at okay, the site I'm looking at. I guess okay, that's okay, one of those phantom Jack, changes, right? You, you know what the Jack Vanillo story is? Do you know that story? Oh. You guys don't know? Brian, do you know the Jack Vanillo story? No. This is a great story. Uh, Ric Flair went down to, um, was it San Domingo or was it Venezuela? Looks like it says Dominica, so I don't, it didn't say. It didn't Dominican say it Republic. Said. Okay, Dominican Republic. Okay, Ric Flair goes to the Dominican Republic. He's wrestling Jack Venino, who's the local hero. There's about 30,000 people in the stadium, and something happened. I think that there was a gunshot towards the ring or something really weird. And Ric Flair panicked and basically pulled Jack Benino on top of him and told the referee to count to three and got out of the building. And then in the dressing room, they gave him back the title. Ric Flair actually never beat Jack Benino back for the belt. So Jack Benino is the real old NWA World Heavyweight Champion? He no, is Carlos the lineal Colon- champion. Carlos Colon is because Carlos, uh, or whoever holds that universal title, because Carlos beat Ric Flair in that unification match, and then Rick came back to the States with the belt in 83. Right, yeah, it says here he beat him 83, uh, January 83. Corey2.com is uh, all the world title uh, stuff up there, which is kind of a neat thing to look at. And you mentioned uh, Flair and the uh, broomstick. You saw the match. I didn't because I wasn't watching WCW then, but you said he had a pretty good match with Russo. I guess Russo would probably be Oh, he had a good match with Russo, yes. Russo is about as close to a uh, broomstick as you're going to get. You know, he had a a three-and-a-quarter star match with El Gigante, too. Really? Are there tapes of that? Um, I... Don't know. But you saw it live? Um, no, he had them in every, like in every city. Wow. I mean, it was like it wasn't like one. He had a lot of them. How could and, he? And, and I, I can't even I, I can't even visually comprehend how that's possible. I mean, yeah. I don't understand. Like, Del Gandhi couldn't because, sell anything. Because how could he beat him? <laughs> No, I, think, like, I think there was a person. Or or? I think they probably did a dusty finish. But in those days, he was Ric Flair. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's true. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was I, I would, the Dr. Cerebro, El Hia de Santa News, is, I, I find that pretty depressing because Dr. Cerebro has, like, the greatest mask in Lucha Libre. Have you ever seen Cerebro wrestle? Yeah, yeah, I saw him when he wrestled for Troy Human. Yeah, he's, um, he's, he's been having, he's had the belt in IWRG, one of the, the Welterweight titles or something like that. I, IWRG TV's kind of hard to get. But he's having really, he's a really great worker. He kind of reminds me of a young Blue Panther in the way he does, he does math stuff. And his mm-hmm. mask is just so amazing. It's such a shame that he's got to lose it. Well, maybe he won't. But it's probably my favorite mask in Lucha Libre. He will. Brian, they don't do screw jobs there. Yeah, they don't do screw jobs. It was WCW, WCW, WWF, he wouldn't really lose but, the mask. But he's losing the mask, you know, yeah. Absolutely no chance of Elliot Santa losing. Mm, not until he's like 68 years old, like his dad, when he finally unmasked. Yeah, but I mean... Uh, even though his dad never lost the match, the match, though he just kind of no, 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 no. His dad was going to die, so he took the mask off once, yeah. and then he died. It was the curse. Yeah, I know the. Um, but I figure, yeah, I figure El Hijo de Santa will probably be buried in it. Like they his let dad was. a couple. Of the most luchadors they don't let retire with them. That's why I never understood. Was, was why Demon wasn't buried with Demon, Demon wasn't buried with his mask? Was he? It, they didn't handle it well. Demon? It wasn't that big of a deal. But Blue Demon, when Blue Demon died a couple weeks ago, Rey Mysterio Jr. and Psycho just lost their mask. Because they, you know, would anyway. They just didn't handle it good. But the actual, the actual act of unmasking them isn't such like this huge, uh, you know, insult. I think Demon was buried in it, wasn't he? Yeah, Demon I don't was. Remember. Yeah, he was. Demon remember was there was a mask. picture of him in the coffin. Oh, okay. And the other thing was, I went to the uh, Super Eight um, this weekend. How was it? That was a great show, a really great oh, show. Good. Um, I was probably maybe from top to bottom the best live wrestling card I've ever been to. I mean, really? the battle royal. The, the battle royal was bad. I mean, real bad, really bad. But uh, and the, the other stuff, the tag match with the Haas brothers wasn't very good. They, uh, I, I was shocked about the Haas brothers because they're they work Memphis, right? Now. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the Steve Regal. I mean, Steve Regal was there. Bill Dundee's there. Jerry Lawler's there, and they still can absolutely throw some of the worst punches I've ever seen. And you know, well, that's, you that's think the, that's, that's the, the one thing you might a, learn a lot of the new, is how to throw a, a, lot of the a new correct guys. worst punch. A lot of new guys in wrestling, I mean, they don't punch like the old guys, because the old guys, you said, you know, the punch was their big move, so, you know, you, you better be good at it. Now, you know, everyone does all these high spots, so you don't concentrate as much on the punch, and then when you do the punch, you know, you know, especially for people who've watched wrestling for a long time, 
you're used to a good looking punch and then you see a bad looking punch and it's like, ugh, God, don't ever punch. Yeah, I mean, and that's then, what I was thinking during that ma- the tag match they had. It was, um, it was just like, good Lord, I mean, talk, sit, have Bill Dundee. Go, go find him in the back. Have him sit you down so you have to throw a punch. Because, I mean, you know, when you do all the springboards. That's, not, that's not a bad idea. Bill Dundee always did throw a cool punch. I mean, when you get to that, when it, you look so, that looks so fake. I mean, it just like kills the entire, uh, you, you know what, though, Bill Dundee, now that he's 60 years old, he may not throw such a great punch, so maybe you... <laughs> I saw some MCW stuff with Bill Dundee. Does he still? I haven't now. seen, I haven't seen Dundee wrestle good. in about a year and a half. Definitely old, but he still threw a, he still knew how to throw a, throw a good work punch. I mean, I think you, mm-hmm. you forget how to do that. Um, as far as the guys, I thought they looked really good. American Dragon looked really good. I mean, yeah, I've seen him. Far, he, is, um, he is very good. You know what's, what's so sad to me is there are guys under devo- WWF developmental contracts, you know, like they're... And American Dragon's one of them, and Flash Flanagan's another one of them. Deep and, and, and they're better than Big Show. Well, no, well, that, no, but but like you know when Jim Ross does the report on the guys they're going to bring up, yeah, he's, they're they're never on the report, and it just tells me that they have no intention of ever bringing these guys up. And these guys are like, they're like good. I mean, American Dragon was great. I mean, he really looked, um, pro- he looked like the best independent worker in the world now that Modest and Daniels are signed on that night. I mean, he had a really good match with Spanky, which you would expect because they worked each other so much. He had a, a, the best Reckless Youth match I've ever seen. Like, I don't think they, they might work each other once or twice in Memphis, but... Um, and then he had a really, I don't know that really, they, I don't really, know they really good match with Loki, and I don't, I'm sure they've never wrestled each other before. And it was just, you know, three matches, um, all three of them, you know, really, really great. And the other thing, which is one of the things that we noticed stylistically, which is kind of cool, and... Um, uh, maybe, Brian, you want to talk about this, is that from years ago, this is the third Super 8 I've been to, is the big problem I noticed in the first couple, and we were talking about it earlier with the punches, is that the work was really loose, and it's a U.S. Indie, sort of a traditional U.S. Indie thing, but all the, a lot of these matches were really, really, really stiff, like almost, the um, American Dragon Loki was Japan-level stiff as far as the kicks and the chops and things like that. And um, American, and, and same thing with... Uh, with American Dragon Spanky, which is so weird because you don't think of Shawn Michaels as being the world's stiffest worker. Ooh, what's that? Oh, what was that? Is that your fire alarm? That was not a fire alarm. That was uh, like someone being paged or something. Oh. Well, he's gone. Let's go to the uh, let's, go, let's go to Scott. Scott. Hey. Scott. Hey. Hey, what's going on? Oh, I'm doing fine. You know, something really occurred to me last night watching Raw. The whole thing with uh, the Vince Trish, you know, that whole bit with the uh, the flop bucket. Yeah. Am I the only one who think you have Vince McMahon standing triumphant, you have a woman being humiliated, and then you have that scatological humor that he loves so much. Did we actually see Vince McMahon's id manifest itself live in front of an entire audience? Oh, absolutely. I think we see that every week. Yeah. When he, when that, I remember that one show where he just tore off in the limo at about 60 miles an hour, and I thought, this guy's been waiting to do this his whole life. <laughs> and the other thing is to do it. No, and this was another one. It's like, it's like, you know, this is the excuse to humiliate some, you know, girl that took him for a ride, you know, 34 years ago or something. Well, probably not because he was married, but, you know, I mean, this, these are all, these are all things, you know. I'm just waiting for him to have a heel sportscaster. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long before he bases the character on Jim Rome? Well, it'll be Mushnick before Jim Rome. No. Oh. Actually, he wasn't, um... No, 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 no. What, no, who was the one that was going to be the Mushnick? The, the guy with the sign at live or something? The guy with the sign, I think, was supposed to be Bozell. Yeah, that and then was Richards turned into Boz- And Richards turned into Bozell. There was something, they were doing a Phil Mushnick at some point, too. I'm trying to remember. I will. But, uh... I remember I was watching it with a couple of friends of mine and thinking to myself afterwards, like... Okay, the ring is now going to be all slippery and wet for the rest of the night. I bet the next match is going to have the light heavyweight. <laughs> and out come Dean Malenko and, and Kai and Tai on. <laughs> and every time well, I watch Kai and Tai, I just start weeping for what's going to become to Tajiri. 